Greetings to all my fellow time travellers who are there faithfully in the capsule as we hurtle through space and time. This podcast series is, uh, well, it's a look at the past to see the lessons that we ought to be learning. So many lessons that we've never learned how we might best navigate a path into the future based on the successful endeavours of those who have survived similar travails in the past. And heaven knows we need as much help as possible to navigate through the present. Today's episode is about Solomon's Temple, the first one on that site uh, for which were commissioned uh, Phoenician craftspeople. Hiram Abiff was the designer and principal builder of that temple. To help support the series and to get access to exclusive videos every week, sign up to my patreon.com site. Uh, It's easy. Just go to patreon.com, look for me by name and part with some cash. And it's that cash that enables everything else that we do. So if you do that, uh, sign up for a month, sign up for a year. It's cheaper by the year, actually. But however you do it, it'd be lovely to see you behind the Behind the Velvet Curtain. Okay, it's time to strap into the time machine as we hurtle off towards the next stop in my love letter to the world. Recorder, microphone, action. This is why it's the moment that matters. It was probably their most glamorous commission. As empires rise and fall around them, a society with people of great skill and enterprise is born. Their cities hugging the Mediterranean coast, growing ever more prosperous with travel, trade and endeavour. Their scholars created an alphabet that stretched all the way into the present. Famous for renowned architects, engineers and builders of immense skill. A people who built a legendary temple whose name echoes around the world to this day. Endeavouring to understand history in hopes of illuminating the future. I'm Neil Oliver and this is my love letter to the world. Hi Neil. In the last episode, we watched as a unique system of social organisation was developed in India. Which moment in history are we travelling to this week? Well Paul, uh, we're leaving India, the place where the caste system evolved and the oldest religion in the world was born, and we're travelling to the ancient Phoenician cities, hugging a beautiful stretch of the Mediterranean coast. The moment we've come to witness is when King Solomon commissioned Phoenician builders to design and construct a temple, the like of which the world had never seen. Well, we're on the, I suppose we're in the, we're in territory that most people, I suppose, would most easily understand as the Holy Land, really, that eastern Mediterranean coastline. And we're dealing with a moment in the story of the world that's written by, made by, a people, one of the elder peoples, called the Phoenicians. But before we get to them, I, I would say that this one, this part of the world, was was really brought sharply back into my attention on the 4th of August 2020. So as recently as that, folk would have seen it on the, on the television and elsewhere, there was a massive explosion in a warehouse by the sea uh, in the Lebanese capital, Beirut. You remember, it was a terrifying image. You know, the, the explosion, it threw up a mushroom cloud. It, it was a catastrophic explosion. It was thousands and thousands of tonnes of ammonium nitrate, which is a chemical that's used for, well, amongst other things, for fertiliser. Somehow or other, it caught fire. The fire hit the warehouse. It, it was all a bit murky, really exactly what had happened because ammonium nitrate can also be used is also used for making explosives and there were all sorts of suspicions that maybe uh, people who didn't want there to be a big source of potential explosives in Lebanon 
uh, may have got rid of it all in one go. Anyway, that's speculation. The point is, thousands of tonnes of ammonium nitrate stored in a warehouse by the sea caught fire and exploded all in a terrifying instant. In fact, it was one of the largest non-nuclear explosions ever recorded. Okay, so if you take you know atomic blasts out of the equation, and if you're just looking at you know explosions caused by whatever dynamite and the rest, this was up there. This is one of the largest ever recorded. It was somewhere between a fifth and a tenth of the explosive power that flattened Hiroshima. So it was as as much as a fifth, perhaps, of that power. So devastating. It levelled, you know, the blast wave that came out from it, it levelled buildings all around it, threw up this enormous, uh, terrifying mushroom cloud. Hundreds of people were killed or injured, and hundreds of thousands were made homeless because their homes were destroyed or, or damaged beyond living in. It created, it left a crater 500 feet wide, and apparently the sound of the explosion was heard 120 miles away in Cyprus. That part of the world, Beirut, Lebanon, for people, I suppose, of our generation, you and me, Paul, we were old enough to be aware of the civil war there in the 70s, and in fits and starts, it ran on until 1990. And no sooner was the civil war, well, whatever, dealt with, settled, than there was the, the steady rise of all sorts of sectarian stuff under the politics of the, the, the Shia Muslims of the Hezbollah group. And it means that for people of, of yours and my age, Lebanon is sort of synonymous with trouble. You think about it and, you know, you think about those poor people, you know, we're constantly, we were constantly showing images of, you know, those wrecked tower blocks, concrete, the windows blasted out, cavities in them, people crawling about in the dust, children injured, dead. Those were just recurring, upsetting images. But you and I, we are old enough to just about remember when the Lebanon was glamorous. Beirut used to be a real, a luxury destination. Our parents' generation would have known, would have looked at Beirut as being one of those places that you went if you had money. It was a, a luxurious destination. That The mountains of, of Lebanon are tall enough to be capped with snow. And so Lebanon became known as the Switzerland of the East. People skied there, you know, people went for glamorous skiing holidays and then of course you could come down onto the coastline at the other end of the year and, and have a, a, a luxurious beach type holiday. Uh, Beirut was extremely chic. It was like Paris. In fact, they called it the Paris of the Middle East. But I do remember, or I think I remember, if I don't actually remember, I've, I've certainly seen the footage more recently of, you know, glamorous people sashaying about Beirut, men in linen suits and women in short dresses and all looking very glamorous and luxurious and all the rest of it and you know those those days are gone and so there's a sadness and it, it was it was brought back all of it all of the th all of my thoughts about Lebanon were brought back by that terrible explosion just something else that was sad and destructive in that part of the world and so i think there's something about when you grow old enough to simply remember the past and never mind if you're interested in history and you've read back decades and centuries and, and even millennia, when you see the way things so often play out, you're not as surprised by events in the present day. Because there, there are these cyclical, recurring stories. You know, Mark Twain is, is usually credited with saying that history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes and it certainly does feel like that. And when you know the way things tend to work out, you can become quite predictive about what you think is going to happen next, given a, a certain set of circumstances. And then when you look at somewhere like the devastation in somewhere like the Lebanon, it hurts when you know that it used to be different. It's painful when you've got actual memories or if you've seen footage of when the place was altogether different and altogether different lives were possible there. So that's the kind of backstory for, you know, that, that part of the world. Lebanon is a word, a name that has roots in the Semitic languages. 
It's quite a different way of structuring a language or a vocabulary. Lebanon is really originally first appears as just LBN, minus the vowels. The vowels are added later. And that sound, that LBN, means white in the Semitic languages. So it, probably from distant ancient times, that's a reference to the mountains. You know, when you were in the vicinity of the Lebanon, you would see the mountains looming. And so the, the name that was applied to it in ancient times said something about white. Alba, in our part of the world, has the same meaning. Alba in Scotland, Albion for England, it means white. And people speculate that it might be to do with the white cliffs of Dover in the case of England. You know, that people coming through from Europe would first see England uh, as, as the white cliffs. So anyway, white. And it's also worth remembering in the context of where we're going, that the Greek island of Lemnos, like Lebanon, has roots that mean that mean white. And Lemnos is, is, is white for the same reasons. And it's also that Lemnos is a name with Phoenician origins. Uh, and Phoenician, amongst other things, also refers to an alphabet, to a language. And all of it explains, all of it is backstory, to the fact that Lebanon, once upon a time, was home to the Phoenician civilization. The Phoenicians were a Semitic people. Semitic is really a reference to a group of languages. It's different, disparate groups of people who are, who are united one way or another by similarities in the languages that they speak. Uh, it's people of Arabic, origin that share those Semitic languages. In the Bible, uh, Noah, when the ark comes to rest on Ararat, his sons are Ham, Japheth and Shem. And it's the languages that descend from Shem's descendants that are Semitic. So think Shemitic rather than Semitic. Uh, so that's, this is a language group that goes all the way back into the deep, dark biblical history. Now, the Phoenicians, there have always been suggestions that the Phoenicians had a city at Tyre on the Mediterranean coast by 2,700 years BC. Most archaeologists and historians now, though, think that that's a bit much. It's possible. It's difficult to rule these things out, absolutely. But they will say that there was probably a city of that name in that location 1,500 years before the birth of Christ. You know, so not quite the 2,700 years claimed in some from some sources, but let's say you know three and a half thousand years ago. Three and a half thousand years ago, uh, there was a city there. There was also a city at Byblos and at Sidon, and those were the coastal cities of the Phoenician people. And the Phoenician people have a long and mostly forgotten history, not forgotten by historians, not forgotten by archaeologists, but. As I said at the top, it's, it's one of those names, the Phoenicians, it's just one of those names that people have heard, but the explanation for who they were and what they did, you know, for a lot of people it just falls down through a crack in the floorboards. It's a difficult part of the world in which to get things going at that time. Inland was arid, uh, very dry, not a lot of rainfall, it's, it's a difficult place in which to go crops. Where there were people inland, they tended to be isolated one from another, uh, because they were, they, as well as it being arid, the, the terrain was broken up by s steep hills, valleys. So they, they, there were obstacles in between people, and so there'd be there'd be isolated groups, isolated little bits of civilization. The terrain, the landscape, was not conducive to people coming together in large numbers. So people remained isolated from one another. Things were a bit better. Things were a bit more productive, or significantly more productive, on the narrow ribbon by the sea. That coastal strip, you know, was where it became possible for civilization to develop to the point where there were settled and developed coastal cities. And they made their livings from the sea. Those coastal Phoenicians built ships and they embarked on trade. And by their skill as mariners, they became an important conduit. They were the link between Africa and Asia. They were moving across the Mediterranean, moving around the Mediterranean, so they were going on to North Africa, they were trading 
taking things that the Africans wanted, bringing things back, moving. So they became, you know, they became a dynamic link in that part of the world at that time. Now, their civilization coincided with some of that of Egypt. That was a far bigger, far more dominant civilization. You know, and to some extent, the Phoenicians were bullied by the Egyptians. The Egyptians were in the habit of having the Phoenicians fell and bring their great giant cedar trees for building projects. And one way or another, the Phoenicians became known, as well as being mariners and traders, they became known as builders, engineers, skilled architects, and the reputation began to spread. In the early days at home, they were dominated by others. They were dominated by their neighbours. So the Egyptians, uh, the Hebrews from the, from the Promised Land, so-called Hittites and others. And so at home it was difficult. So they did better by reaching out and trading and making contact with civilizations elsewhere. And so they practised and learned and became amongst the most adept sailors and, and mariners in that, in that part of the world at that time. They were in it for the long game. The big neighbours began to fall away. Egypt went into decline and remained in decline, became less of a problem. The great Bronze Age civilization of uh, Mycenae declined and fell. The Hittites declined and fell. And it was in that moment when they were left alone, when they had the playing field to themselves, that the Phoenicians had their time in the sun. Sometime after 1000 BC, they have their moment. The moment that seems to me to matter in the story of the world. They were commissioned by King Solomon to come and build him a temple. And so they did. King Solomon is one of the, the great kings of the Hebrew story. You've got Saul, you've got David, and you've got Solomon. At that time when, when the kingdom of Israel was on the rise and, and had its high point, King Solomon asked the Phoenicians to come and to build them the temple, the first temple in Jerusalem. And in, in the Bible, depending on what version you read, and I quote, Now therefore command thou that they hew me cedar trees out of Lebanon, and my servants shall be thy servants, and unto thee I will give hire for thy servants according to all that thou shalt appoint. For thou knowest that there is not among us any that can skill to hew timber like unto the Sidonians. And by Sidonians he meant people from the city of Sidon, which is to say Phoenicians. Because by the time of King Solomon, the Phoenicians were the... If you wanted something built on a grand scale, something that was going to last, if you could afford it, you went to the Phoenicians. And so, and so Solomon duly did, and he brought the men in to build, you know, the, the dimensions of the, of the temple are, you know, 60 cubits long and 30 cubits wide and, and all the rest of it. And it wasn't just uh, in Jerusalem that they would have been regarded in that way. All around the ancient world, the Phoenician builders were held in the same regard. King Solomon's temple was probably, and this is why it's the moment that matters, it was probably their most glamorous commission. So these were people who were known as traders, they were known as colonisers all around the Mediterranean, and they were also people on the make. You know, they were out to make the most that they could, they were out to make the most of themselves. But for whatever reason, despite their abilities, despite the fact that they were so adept as mariners, so adept as builders, their light was kind of under a bushel. They never really seemed to have sung their own song. They never seemed to have broadcast their own achievements. And so somehow or other, they, they miss out on some of the fame. And it's, I think it's probably to some extent because they were too busy. The Phoenicians were routinely... Uh, sailing the length of the Mediterranean Sea, passing out through the Straits of Gibraltar, because three and a half thousand years ago they were already in the habit of coming to Cornwall to get tin. Cornwall was the biggest, richest source of tin in the ancient world. And if you wanted to make bronze, which everyone did in the Bronze Age, you needed to be able to bring copper together with tin. Wales was a rich source of copper as well, so for people who had the navigational know-how, 
you wanted to get to the British Isles because there you could get the double whammy. You could pick up tin in Cornwall and copper in Wales and then you had both of the ingredients necessary to make bronze. But the Phoenicians were there. 3,500 years ago, the Phoenicians were in Cornwall trading for tin. The fact they've got such strong trading routes shows how sophisticated the ancient world was, doesn't it? Yeah, the, the, the reach, I mean, depending on what mythology you subscribe to, what you're prepared to believe, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a, a relative and a follower of Jesus Christ, he was a, a trader, and he was probably a metal trader, and may well have been in the habit of going as far as the British Isles in pursuit of tin, amongst other things. And it's from that folklore that you get the story about the young Jesus coming to England and did those feet in ancient time walk up in England's pastures green. You can believe or disbelieve that story as much as you want, but that idea at Glastonbury and other locations, this, this folk myth that there's always been that, that young Jesus was there, is possibly explicable in the context of having a relative who was a metals trader. And so it's not that difficult to imagine, well, any youngster, you know, being taken away by an uncle <laughs> for a trip. So this is this this is the range. This is what the, the Phoenicians were capable of. But as I say, they just don't seem to have been boastful. It's it's as though they had their heads down getting on with the business of uh, sailing, trading, making, building. As well as everything else, they produced an alphabet. I mean, let's, pff, let's imagine how it starts. You know, letters scratched in the dust and then made in, in wet clay and preserved. But in any event, the, the alphabet, the lettering system that the Phoenicians developed was ultimately taken up and adapted by the Greeks and so, therefore, also those writing in Latin, they were ultimately dependent upon the Phoenician alphabet. It's from their city, Byblos, that we get the word Bible. Bibliography comes from the name of the Phoenician city of Byblos. And it's all gone now. They had their moment. You know, that moment I like to think of, the moment that matters most, was when they were commissioned by Solomon to build his temple. It was destroyed, of course. The first temple was destroyed and utterly by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon in 587 BC. Uh, and in the aftermath of that siege and that destruction, the elite of Jerusalem were taken away into some kind of exile. Solomon's is an immortal, unforgettable name, even if you know most who hear it now have, have little idea why. He's a biblical king. For many, he's, he's associated with the eponymous song, the Song of Solomon. The fabled gold mines, King Solomon's mines, that were described by the novelist H. Ryder Haggard. And the very name Phoenician, it's, it's just, it's a, well, it's a veritable name to conjure with. The temple that was built on Solomon's orders in his name is gone, utterly. And the Phoenicians who built it, the same that sailed their ships to Cornwall, now bear a name that is largely forgotten by most. But I think about that moment in my mind's eye. I think about them on the ground, architects, engineers, builders, up on that, that high point in the city of Jerusalem, the elite of their kind, called upon all over the ancient world to go and design and make and build the things that others could not. And at the same time, their ships would have been at sea, reaching out into the unknown, reaching out as far or further than anybody else at that time. And they are gone. You know, another temple, another temple was subsequently built on the same spot, not by Phoenicians. Uh, and it too was destroyed, like the first one. Although Jews, to this day, still pray at one wall of it, the Wailing Wall. That's the remaining wall of the second temple. And that temple, that second temple, was built where it was. That, that site was chosen in remembrance of what the original temple built by the Phoenicians had meant. So that, that wailing wall uh, and, the, and the temple of which it is a fragment, it matters in no small part because of where it stands 
which is to say on a place where once stood a temple built by Phoenicians. Do we know much about how it was built? The story of the of the construction of, of Solomon's temple is there in the Book of Kings in the Old Testament. There's talk amongst much else of Solomon being pr- provided with cedar and cypress trees for the construction of the temple. And the, the Phoenicians tell Solomon that they'll be transported over sea. I will make them into rafts to go by the sea to the place that you indicate. I will have them broken up there for you to take away. The trade seems to have been for wheat and oil. So Solomon paid for the, paid for the lumber and the construction in wheat and oil. And the kings talks about the, the, the men coming from Tyre to oversee and to, and to take care of the, the construction, to cut stones, because it was a construction with a timber frame and a stone shell. For fans of Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, the, the temple was also built as the place for the Ark of the Covenant. So the Ark of the Covenant, which is to say the box containing the stone slabs upon which the Ten Commandments had been dictated for Moses. And it was understood by Solomon and those around him that there had to be a special Holy of Holies within a temple where the Ark of the Covenant could reside. I have built you an exalted house, a place for you to dwell in forever. With that story connected to it, it's no wonder it's famous in Jord, is it? Well, that's the you know that was the that was the I suppose to some extent the central function of the temple. But for me, it's that memory of a people otherwise forgotten. Uh, it's to remember that that site, you know, which is still a focus of so much passion, where Jews to this day go and pray at the Wailing Wall. You know, well, that second temple was built to remember to mark the spot where the first temple, King Solomon's temple, was built. And it was built by Phoenicians. Immortal heroes, powerful heroines and formidable warriors, high drama, devastating wars and epic journeys, weaving history with fiction, linking the past with the present, casting aside the illusion of nostalgia and remaining tied to the present. Next time in my love letter to the world. To help support this podcast and to get access to new and exclusive history and comment vodcasts every week, sign up to my Neil Oliver Patreon site. Be great to see you there. Check out the Instagram account called Neil Oliver Love Letter. My YouTube channel is simply called the Neil Oliver Channel. And to help build this podcast, please tell your friends about it. Get them listening and write a review to convince the online crowd to join us. For further reading about these moments in time, you could try my book. It's called The Story of the World in 100 Moments and it's published by Transworld. Neil Oliver's Love Letter to the World is produced by Paul Ratcliffe and Neil Oliver for Fat Belly Films. Music is composed by Milo McKinnon. Social media and YouTube producer is Oscar CFR. Additional research is by Evie, Lucian, Archie and Teddy. Finance is by Catherine and Trudy. Post-production is by Althorp Studios and the graphics are by Paul Plowman. Thanks for listening. This has been an FBF Podcasts production.